Private Lender Podcast, Episode 62. The Private Lender Podcast quote of the day comes to us from Winston Churchill, who said, We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. This is the Private Lender Podcast, the show that shares practical advice and know-how for new and seasoned lenders, from private mortgages on single-family houses to joint ventures on commercial projects and beyond. Discover details about investment vehicles that you won't find at your local bank or online broker. Listen and learn from private lenders and real estate investors, as well as from professionals and entrepreneurs, as they share the details, strategies, and the insight that allows for successful and prosperous lending. Now, get ready to increase your ROI. Here's your host, Keith Baker. Hey there, hello and greetings from the energy capital of the world, Houston, Texas. Welcome to the Private Lender Podcast, the place to be if you're looking for practical tips and advice on how to become a successful private lender. If you're looking to build wealth without banks or Wall Street by utilizing time-tested methods in this ever-changing world, then you're in the right place. My name is Keith Bacon, and today I speak with Alan Cowgill, who was the first person to put the concept of private lending into my noggin several years ago, and I'm honored to have him on the show. And speaking of the show, you can probably tell that I've been making some changes here and there over the last few weeks, particularly in the format, whereas I've gotten away from selling mid-roll advertisements, mostly because I just didn't feel like it was me, it suited me. So I like the show, the flow of the show, I should say, I think better without the adverts. So just experimenting with that to see how it goes. I've also brought in some more plans, reevaluated a few things, and hope to broaden the topics of the interviews a little and to go into some areas that hopefully bring you, the listener, value in other aspects of your life, not just in investing in real estate, So, but very closely tied to all that. So let's go ahead and cut to the chase and get to the interview with Alan Calgill. Lender Nation, I'm excited to introduce to you Alan Calgill, who is one of the the people who got the private lending kernel in my brain about a decade ago, and it's an honor to have him on. Alan, welcome to the Private Lender Podcast. Well, thank you very much. I'm tickled to be here. It's exciting for me. Just to give the listeners some background, I was introduced to Alan about 10 years ago. I went to a Larry Goins boot camp, and Alan came up and said, you know, how many of you guys deal with private lenders? You need to work with private lenders. And Long story short, going to the real library, finding one of your old programs on cassette tape and whatnot and CD and trying to put it all together. Here we are in 2019. So I'm stoked. Thank you for coming on. And amongst the many, many questions that I have, I'm going to try to narrow it down for you to just a few. But I'd like you to tell our listeners how you got started in this whole real estate game. Oh, yeah. Well, I was broke. (laughs) (laughs) I got a quarter century in corporate America. As I was climbing that corporate ladder, one day I realized I had the ladder against the wrong wall and I had to do something else with my life. I'd seen so many of my family members work at JLB all their life and retire poor. And I thought, you know, I don't want that to happen to me. And what I was going through, though, is I was, like I said, I was broke. Even though I'd been successful in corporate America, I was living in a little dinky two-bedroom apartment and I was struggling, paying my bills. And kind of let you know what was happening is I had this old beat-up car. And I needed to put some repair work into it, but I I put that on the back burner like we do. And I was busy doing other things and paying my bills going along. And all of a sudden on a first date, this car paid me back. And it's kind of an ugly story. I pulled up in front of this apartment complex and walked through the door after our very first date. And halfway up to the door, I heard something. I turned around and looked, my car had burst into flames. (laughs) (laughs) Keith, when I tell people this, when I speak on stage, somebody on the back room, you a hot date, you know, or something like that. Well, I was about to say, yeah. It's more like first and last date. Can you imagine how embarrassing it is holding your hand, watching a fireman put your car out? Here's this successful middle manager in corporate America, and he can't even afford to get his car fixed. Well, every morning when she woke up, there was a burnt chard mark in a parking lot. What an impression she made <laughs> in that apartment complex. So, I, yeah, yeah, I looked into franchises, but they take money. I didn't have the money to get a franchise. You know, I was trying to figure out what to do outside of corporate America. And I did decide to invest. So I took my whole federal tax return that year and plunked it down on lottery tickets. Now you're thinking not the sharpest tool in the shed, right? Yeah, I lost on every ticket. Yeah. Yeah. Lost on every I've been there. Yeah. (laughs) And I was worried about paying my bills one night and I couldn't sleep. And at two o'clock in the morning, I got up and turned on the TV and started to channel surf. And I hit one of these real estate infomercials and it got my attention. And I thought, you know, maybe I can do this. And I picked up the phone and I ordered that home study system. I didn't have the money to hardly do it because I spent my money that day on lottery tickets. But 
they take a credit card and I ordered that system and I became enthralled with real estate. And that year I bought two houses my very first year. The next year I bought five. The following year I bought 18. And since that point in time, I've done hundreds of real estate deals and half the deals I do are without monthly payments. So we can talk about that later on if you'd like. Yeah, all because I've got private lenders, but that's how I got started in this business off a TV commercial. And now as a side note, I'm in three nationwide infomercials that's played over the years. So I was going to ask you, what program did you purchase? Oh, it was Carlton Sheet. Carlton. Yep. Okay. Carlton Sheet. Yep. yep. He's got a lot of people started way back then. So, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's interesting. So what were your exit strategies? Were you flipping, buying and holding? When I started out, first property I bought was a side-by-side double. And the goal was to hold it. And I started to do that for a few years, buy and hold. And I'd buy duplexes and side-by-side doubles and cut into some single family homes. And I decided that along the way, I'd like to buy, fix and sell. So I started doing that. And then I realized that in the areas that I was buying in, that people would move into the houses and many times do a rent to own on it and they'd tear the house up and leave. And so they had more of a renter mentality where I was buying. And so I had to move up into higher level property and that helped quite a bit. So I call it the model. You know, what model do you want in this business? And like I said, I started out with buy and hold and then I went into buy and sell and it's a learning experience. And so you just focus in on what you hit on what works and you stay there. Absolutely. How did you get introduced into private lenders? What happened was I'm coming up through my real estate education, and I believe the foundation of this business is exactly what you and I are doing right now, is training. And so I focused on getting a solid education in this business, and I'd go to RIA events and go to boot camps. And I heard this thing about hard money lenders and private lenders, and I thought they were the same thing. I thought it was just interchangeable terms. And actually, it's extremely different from one to the other one, because with a hard money lender, they set the rules and they want to have money down. So you get some what they call skin in the game. So mine wanted 15% down. And that's a showstopper for some people that's getting started. And so 15% down, and then they would have to get paid. And the way a hard money lender gets paid is they charge you what they call points, which is really a percent of how much money they loan you. And they take that right off the settlement statement, right off the, when you buy. So that comes right out of your side of it. And then they want to churn this money over and over again. So they put you on a short-term commitment on this where they have balloon payments and typically it's within a year so that they can get that money back and get it working again. They can get another 5%. And so after a while though, I realized that private lenders was different. And I realized that I got to set the rules. You know, Keith, there's only four parts of a real estate deal at the very pinnacle, at the very top. Number one is you got to find a property that's good to buy. Number two is you got to have money. Number three is you fix the property to enhance the value. And number four is you flip it or keep it long term. Well, if you can't get by this second item, you're dead in this business. Well, what happened is any other place you go to look for money out there, somebody else is setting the rules, like a bank and you know lending institutions. And that's what a hard money lenders, they set the rules. But I realized with the private lenders from my education of going to these events, once I had this untangled, that I got to set the rules. And that was so appealing to have here one of the biggest of the, of the four items out there where I could set my own financing rules. And so I went back to my mom and she had come into some money because my dad had passed away. And she took that money and she had not been taking care of the finances in the house uh, when we were growing up. But she realized that she could plunk that money down on a bank certificate of deposit. And she would study the rates and she would drive 45 minutes one way to get a few pennies more on a CD because she knows she'd have to live off this money. And so this was 20 some years ago. And now she's 93 years old and she's still got some money out there. So what happened was I went back to mom and I said, look, I said, you're getting a poultry low rate of return on a bank CD. I can pay you three, four, five times what you're getting on a bank CD. I'll give you a mortgage, a promissory note, has insurance, lender title insurance. And mom jumped for joy. And I said, I'll even pay you monthly. And she loved that because that's what the CD was doing. It was giving her a monthly income of a small amount. I could give her a lot more. So mom was my very first lender. And what that did was by getting that first lender, it gives you the confidence to do it again, be able to talk to other people about it. And it shows you the way, how the paperwork's handled and and how to structure things. And so that got me out of the chute. That's where I started. That's a good story. And I won't borrow from my parents, <laughs> but that's a different story. But 
I have the same frustrations. Well, looking at their finances as I'm sure your mother, you know, the CDs aren't paying anything. And the reason I like private lending so much is because I could keep my day job and yet still invest in real estate Yes, in a, a relatively passive and secure manner. Mm-hmm. There is some work, some due diligence up front. I kind of espouse a very conservative view because at the end of the day, I know people, if I tell somebody, don't ever do a second position lien. I do them. But there are certain instances where I would do them. Mm-hmm. But by and large, I tell people not to. And I like the fact that you said, you know, you were able to set your financial terms, right? And that's, to me, the beauty of the private lenders is, like you said, hard money lenders, they want those points because that's their money. So that's where they make their profits. And the interest is usually going back to someone who they have borrowed the money from at a lower rate, generally speaking. So yeah, they want to turn that money over. Mm-hmm. Private lenders tend to want to just keep the money working, yeah. you know, and not have the hassle of going around and originating a loan every six months on a flip or something like that. I actually recommend people do that at first, you know, get tired of the process, you know, every three to six months of loaning on a flip mm-hmm. to learn the process, get in there, see the nuts and bolts, see the machine, the gears, and then, you know, back out, lower your expectation on interest rate a little bit mm-hmm. and watch how long people like yourself will use your money and just keep it coming in month after month after month after month. That was one of the things, like I said, that attracted me to you when you spoke at the Goins Boot Camp. But now you've, you know, you're not just buying some flips or some rentals. Like you said, you're educating. You've got systems out there that I know took you a long time and a lot of attorney's fees to create. That's one of the beautiful, you keep people in line, investors safe. You, you show them the roadmap. I understand you're not an attorney, but you've used many of them to create this. But it's a roadmap of how an investor can stay safe, especially with securities and exchange commission at the state and federal level. Whereas private lenders, we're not regulated like that. As long as we're using our own money, we can do what you want. Yeah, do what you want. I mean, check with your local state attorneys and whatnot. But you know, it's kind of the Wild West if it's your money. Now, if I borrowed your money, Alan, and then loaned it out, now we're getting into a whole new different situation. So you figured this out and then kind of walk us through we're in the same boat, but on the opposite side, sort of. So kind of walk us through how you keep investors who are the flippers and the landlords. How do you keep them safe? What happens is, first off, is I don't touch their money. I have it go to a formal closing. And the reason that's important is because we commit to the private lender that their money is secured by real estate, number one. And so you don't want to violate what you tell the private lender. You do what you say. And so I don't touch unsecured money. And early on, I would have private lenders that would be so excited about giving me money, you know, they'd want to hand me a check on the spot because they wanted to get that high rate of return and they were so tired of the low returns they were getting. But I learned early on that you don't touch those checks. You let them go to a closing. And in Ohio here, we can close with attorneys and, you know, our title companies. And so what I do is, let's say for an example, that I'm talking to you and I ask you if you want to loan me money. And you say, yeah, I'd like to loan you $200,000. The first thing I'll do is I'll use my up the ante technique where I'll ask if I find a deal worth 400000 should I call you? And if you say yes, then I instantly went from 200000 to 400000 In fact, I had a lady in my boot camp. I got a live event. She asked somebody for money and the other person, the lender, said, yeah, I'll loan you 100000 And my student used the up the ante technique I just gave you. And they went to 200000 and within 20 seconds, she had her up to $900,000, but she just kept asking the same question. And so that's how powerful the up the ante technique. But then to follow on what you want, how do we handle this, is I would shake your hand once you say, yeah, we can do $400,000. i would shake your hand and I'd say you made a wise decision. And then I'd shift into what I call the mechanics, which means I tell you how the money is handled because being a new private lender, you don't know. And just like I said, you might think, well, I got to cut a check today or, you know, get Alan the check tomorrow. Well, I want you to understand going in how this works. And I say, what happens is you don't make the check out to me. What we're going to do is we're going to go to a formal closing, just like you would if you were with the bank. And in fact, you are my bank. And what will happen is I'll have you wire the money into the closing that I tell you. And I'll call you up four to six weeks from now and we'll close on the deal. I just need you to be ready for that. Does that work for you? And they always say yes. And so let's roll the clock forward now. If I get down four weeks and I don't have a property that I'm happy with for us, I will get a hold of you because communication is so key with your private lenders because private lenders loan you money based on the fact that they trust you. And so you want to maintain that trust and keep everything 
out there that they understand what's going on so they aren't frustrated or confused. And so I'll, I would call you up and I'd say, hey, just so you know, I don't see anything right now in the market that is good for you and I. Put us both together. And I say, just hang in there another four weeks and we'll have something going. And so they're cool with that. And then what will happen is seven to 10 days before closing, I'll call you up. You send the wire in and we close. And the lenders never, ever, ever go to closing. I'm so glad that you said there's three words. Communication is key. Mm -hmm. Yes, the lender takes on the role of the bank, but this isn't a bank where the tellers change every two weeks. Right. And nobody knows your name except the fees keep going up and up and up. And the fact that the other thing I like that you said is the handshake. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I like to think, at least I espouse on this podcast, is what I call old world values. If you give someone your word, you keep it. You shake your hand, you look them in the eye. There's your contract. Yep. Now, having said that, that's the trust part. Now you got to verify. So get that contract in writing, <laughs> notarized or whatever you need to do mm -hmm. to keep yourself safe. But I'm really glad that you said that. Yeah. Up to that point of where I upped the ante with you just now, everything before that, what I'm trying to do is attract private lenders and convert them you know, into private lenders. And so what will happen... Before that, you know, I might invite them to a one-on-one -on -one meeting or I might have a group meeting, show them my PowerPoint slides that I use. In fact, I, when I ratcheted up the business from when I got started after my mom, I decided to have a meeting with private lenders and I didn't know if I was going to be alone or if I'd be up in there with 50 folks and 18 people showed up and I had a PowerPoint slide presentation that I put together and I got up in front of them. I told them about my real estate business, my dreams, my aspirations. I showed them my PowerPoint slide. And then I just flat out asked them to loan me money. And I got to tell you, Keith, I didn't know it was going to work, but it did. And I did it again the next month. I only had 12 people show up. But a month or two later, I had grabbed a pad and a pen and I added it up and I had a million dollars to go buy property. And that's how fast it can happen. So I started out like with mom. And the next thing I know, I got a million bucks. Nice. Yeah. You created these private lenders. Yeah. That's what's so impressive about your story is that you hustled this together and you made it happen. Yeah. One of the other things I got thinking about before we started talking is I wanted to share with you what really ramped my private lending business up. I went from tiny stream of money to a river to a flood. And I want to talk about the flood of private money. What happened along the way is I learned that I could use IRA money. People had self-directed IRAs. I could use that money and it's very powerful. In fact, we'll talk about how I pay people here in a little bit, I hope. And so I'll share with you that with people with IRAs or gold. And what I realized was that people that have 401ks, qualified retirement programs, if they have quit, retired, or gotten laid off, they can roll that money over into a self-directed IRA. And when I tapped into that, I got into a flood of money. It was virtually unlimited because what happened with those people is they got this money on stocks or wherever it is in, in the companies that they're with. And many times it's going down and, you know, and they're concerned about that. And a lot of times they got it in a low end money market account. They don't know what else to do with it. And, you know, I come along and I can pay them a high rate of return and secure the money with real estate and they just love it. And so once I tapped into the, the 401k, it turned my money into a flood. But you got to find people that quit, retired, or gotten laid off. And I would venture to guess everybody listening knows somebody that's quit, retired, or gotten laid off. And that's where you want to start. That's great. That's how I got started. I went to a class at Quest IRA and I said, hey, I didn't know you can do this. And they said, not very many people do. And the bulk of my lending is out of my IRA from old 401ks that I've converted. I don't ever see myself retiring, unfortunately, but hopefully so. But yeah, it's great. I've even told my family, and you know, obviously on the podcast, it's a great vehicle. If you're a set it and forget it, and you just want to let someone else choose it, and you don't care, don't want to watch Wall Street or whatever, you know, that's fine. I don't hate Wall Street, but if you want to take a little bit, like I said, self-directed, you know, take a little bit more initiative, a little more control, you can really do some great things and get some good returns, but also in the future, create some pretty interesting partnerships. Oh, yeah. And ventures down the way. And I love you said you had, you had a trickle to the river to the flood. Let's go back to what you mentioned earlier about, you know, setting up deals where you don't have monthly payments. Let's talk about in a typical buy it, fix it, sell it situation. Walk us through what you do with your private lenders. Yeah, sure. Well, well I started out one way and over the years, I've come down to where I pay three different ways and it works great for me. And the way I do that, let's say I'm going to buy a property and fix it up. When I borrow money from a private lender, I just tell them the total amount that I need. 
when you get to closing, it, it's busted down into four areas. One is you got to have money to buy the property. The other one is you got to have money for rehab. The third area is there's closing costs involved. And there, I had a fourth area, which I always borrow a little extra because you can run into a problem with a property after you borrow it. So I borrow a little extra. So if I run into a problem, I don't have to dig into my pocket or I don't have to go out and borrow it again. I got it all done up front. The second thing is that people ought to know is you don't suck every dime out of this. You know, you're going to make so much profit on this deal. Well, when I pull money out at the front end, I take out a little bit of money. I don't take out a lot, but it sure does avoid pain going down the road. So, you know, for an example, if you're doing monthly payments on this, if you have that extra money and you don't have a tenant in the house, let's say, you can carry that with the amount of money you take out up front. And then you save the bigger chunk of money at the end when you sell the property so that you don't end up going upside down or having an alligator or losing money on the thing. So save the bigger chunk of money then in your profit. But I do something that is such a blessing to my business to where I borrow money on the front end and the back end. And you see, as, as investors, when you go out and buy a property and you're borrowing money from a bank or hard money lender, you don't have that chunk of money at the front. You know, in fact, with a hard money lender, they make you start out by using your own money to start the demolition work on the property and you build it up to a certain level. And then you call them up and because they held money back in escrow, they will send in an appraiser that you pay for. And then if you did what you said, then they'll start releasing rehab money. But you have your own money in the property right up front. And so in my world, it's just the opposite. When I walk out of closing, I got a check. And I can do anything I want with that check. But like I said, I keep it to make sure that if I do have a problem with the property, got to put in a gas line or a furnace or something, or I got the money to do that. Now, on these deals, when I borrow money, I like to make monthly payments. And that's why I, I started out. And that's what I do. I monthly payment. So for an example, on a monthly payment right now in this market, let's say I'm paying 6% interest. I will pay the lender back on the 15th of the month. Now, the logic on that is I've got some rentals. Well, on the rentals, sometimes tenants pay late. And so if the tenants are trained to pay on the first, and if I pay my private lender on the 15th, I've got a couple weeks there to get the money in so that I'm not coming into my pocket to pay that private lender. And so I always pay on the 15th, and I pay monthly simple interest only, which means that when I sell that property, I still owe that private lender all the principal that they put into the deal. Now, that's one way. The other way is amortize. Now, that's a lower interest rate than the 6%. We might be at 4 or 5% right now and 4.5%. And, and what I do there is I borrow money from a private lender. And the beauty of this, this is my favorite way, is it pays down over time. And so when I go to pay the private lender back, then what they loan me is going to be amortized down. And so they'll get back less money than what they gave me which is a plus for me. And in some cases, let's say you buy a, a low-end rental and you set it up where you're paying them simple interest only and you're going to pay the place off in seven years, you got a free and clear house. So, you know, it depends on the structure. But that's the second way, amortization. The last way, which gets back to what we were talking about with the IRA folks, self-directed IRAs, is these people don't need monthly payments and because they just want to get their money growing. And so I pay a higher interest rate. Let me take you back in time on this, how this came about, is when I started out with my mom, the going rate in the industry was 15%. And that's what I paid mom and, and started to pay other lenders. Over time, the market shifted and I got feedback from my private lenders that 15% was just too darn good to be true. And so I lowered my interest rate to keep them happy. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and so then what happened was, I went to 10 and 12. I did a split rate. I said 10% if you want monthly payments, just like I described a few minutes ago. Or if you let the money accrue, you get paid when I get paid, which is when I sell the house. And I'll pay 10% and I'll pay 12% if you let the money accrue. What I noticed was every single 100% of the folks with the self-directed IRAs picked the higher percent because they don't need monthly payments. They picked the 12%. Now, I got to tell you, Keith, when I did this, I didn't think anybody would do no monthly payments because my mom wanted monthly payments and the other people I was getting money from had CDs and wanted monthly payments, or I thought they did. And what happened was once I tapped into this 401k pool of money and moved people over into self-directed IRAs from their 401k, those folks always would pick the higher amount. 
And so I found that to be a gold mine. Now that's a double edged sword because let's say for an example, I borrow a hundred thousand dollars from you and I'm paying you 8%. Well, at the end of the first year, I owe you $8,000 in interest on top of what the money you, owe, you know, you gave me. And then on the next year, I owe you another eight, which is 16. By the time I get to the third year, I could be upside down. So if you're going to use this technique of no monthly payments, you got to know how you're going to get out when you get in and you got to have, make sure that the timing is there. And if you can't get out, then what you could do is bring in a, another private lender and amortize the loan and let it start paying back down. You'll have to pay off the first lender and bring in another lender. But now in this current market, like I told you about four and a half percent, if you're going to amortize six percent, if you're going to pay monthly payments, simple interest. And on this last one, if we're going to pay a higher amount of simple interest, but let the money accrue, no monthly payments, I'm paying eight. So that's the three ways that I pay. I'm glad you mentioned that double-edged sword because one of the things that I espouse is always have some type of a trigger. Let's say there's a six-month loan on a fix and flip and you don't take any payments on it. As you know, as a lender, I can't do anything for six months if something goes south on the deal, foreclose or whatever. And if the borrower is communicating with me, there really isn't going to be an issue as long as I'm comfortable with what they're doing and everything kind of makes sense. But if, you know, I'm going to go worst case, I don't hear a word from anybody. I still have to wait those six months. But that's not to say you can't, you know, insist on very, very small payments or some type of quarterly payment, not the full thing or like uh, performance specific default triggers. Like let's say if the roof isn't on after four months or whatever, but you're absolutely right. And this is where the trust comes in and interpersonal aspect of, of lending is yes, I'm loaning on a house. My money's going to be secured by real estate, a piece of property, but I'm really loaning on my relationship to that investor. That's really at the end of the day. And the fact that you've, you've identified that and you just put it out front. That's one of the things I like about your system and, and everything that I've come to know about you because there's no hard and fast rule for lenders. And so- Yeah, you get to set the rules. You're right. With private lenders, we get- to- Yeah, you know, so- and. The other thing, I'd like to backtrack a little bit because as a lender, I wanted to get into this notion of you borrow extra. Let's use some easy math here. $100,000 house, you're going to buy it, fix it, and either sell it or put a tenant in it and refinance it or whatever. Let's say this loan to value is, a, I would limit it at 70% all in, right? So we're coming in a little soft right now. I'm pulling back a little bit, you know, go down into like the, the 65 to 60 percent just to give myself some cushion because of, it might take longer to sell or, or whatever because of the softening market. However, my personal belief is, and I'm not talking about someone who's coming up to me to the first time to borrow money, but if I have a relationship with an investor and they come to me and they say, Keith, I'm going to pull an extra $5,000 out as a contingency, or like you said, I'm worried about that water line or you know, maybe we need the sewer line is going to have to be replaced or, or the foundation work or whatever. As long as the LTV, everything is under my threshold, I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't mind a borrower, you know, being up front saying, look, I'm going to, I'm going to pull a little extra cash. And guess what? If they don't need it, great. They got an extra five grand when it's all said and done. You know, as long as I'm paid as agreed, I'm happy. Yeah. First off on when I ask you to loan me money, I would just give you a number and I have already built in all the different, those four different items that I talked about earlier. And one is the contingency money that you and I are talking about where I add a little extra. I don't go to my lenders and say, I need so much for rehab and so much of that. Now, what happens with you as a lender is you're more savvy on this stuff and you want to look at the numbers so you can see where the LTV is and stuff like that is what I'm gathering. And so in that case, you would see that. And what the lender will do is they'll build it into the rehab costs rather than saying, hey, I need 10000 say, I need 12000 10 they know they need in the, in the two there. The extra two is the contingency money I'm talking about. But you you do more analyst on this thing than what my lenders do. My lenders, what they do is they agree to loan me money and they sit back and wait for me to call them. And then once I pay them back their money, then they're in a nice way coming back and want to know how they can get their money going again because they want to keep it going. That's just a nice way of calling me a troublemaker, right? Is, is that uh... No, not at all. <laughs> I know you, you're actually doing it the way I would do it if I was a lender. There's different strokes for different folks. Absolutely. And one of the things I really like to see is as a borrower come to me and say, look, my rehab budget is 10 grand, but you know what? I want to put another two or three in there just to be safe. Again, if it meets all my lending criteria, I'm fine. You know, I'm fine with it. Right. As long as the math works, you got it. Yeah, exactly. That's the key. And so glad you went back over that. And here's the funny thing too. I mean, like you're a bit of an anomaly. You're not the normal investor who's going to go out and look for private money. I mean, you've basically created this universe 
of, you know, hey, this is what I do and this is how I work. And look at my track record it speaks for itself. And that is so powerful. I know everyone that comes into, you know, they hit their first RIA meeting. Everyone tells them, you know, well, well there's hard money. There's get use the bank if you can. It's the cheapest and so on and so forth. But I've always told people, you know, hard money's there for a reason. If someone hasn't done 10 deals, direct them over to the hard money lender. They got 10 solid loans with the hard money lender. And if they've, they've performed as they as stated, then you can start looking, okay, this person's developed a track record, so on and so forth. In your case, I think your track record precedes you. So it's a little unfair, I guess, to compare you to the listeners. But nonetheless, I like the way you operate. That's the uh, bottom line. And yes, I am a little analytical. My day job, I work in oil field insurance as an adjuster. I deal with risk. Mm-hmm. I see everything that blows up. I handle a lot of other people's money. And it's just refreshing to know, to see everything and to look. Because, you know, I mean, Alan, you could walk into a house and within five minutes, you could know that no, this is not going to work. Right? Not even, probably not even five minutes. I mean, you know, they're asking this. I need them to come down 30 grand. Well, if they're not motivated enough, it's not going to happen. So you just, you know, you walk. And the same thing I think for lending as well is I see people, uh, well, this is what I want to do, which sounds like a great idea. But once I look into it, I'm like, you know, there's just too many traps there. You know, there's too many things that have to go absolutely right to make this happen rather than here's a plan that could take a few hiccups and a few things that went wrong and still be successful. Yep. You're right. hundred percent. So you told us that you, you like people with 401ks and self-directed IRAs. What mm-hmm. else do you look for in a lender? Someone analytical or just... Somebody leaves me alone. <laughs> yeah, I was about to <laughs> say. <laughs> My lenders are amazing folks. But every now and then, you can run into a stinker out there. And that is somebody that wants to tell you how to run the business. And I'll tell you what happened to me early on, early, early on in my career, is I had those luncheons and it was kind of like throwing a pebble into a pond because a ripple effect went out where I started to get calls from other people. And I live in Ohio and I got calls from a guy in Springfield or in um, St. Louis. So it was pretty big, but I never took any money from him. But I did get a call from a guy in Springfield here and the guy said, tell me three properties that you're on and gave it to him. And he went out and he looked at him. And that night in my office on my computer, he was telling me why I should not buy them. And this guy, in my estimation, had like a million dollars to loan. So to me, it was very attractive to let him loan me money. But I had a gut feeling that this is not a guy I want to do business with. And I didn't. And I remember him walking out of the office and I let him think he won. And we never did do business. And I don't know if he had a clue how to buy property or why he thought they were good or bad or anything. I don't know if he ever bought a property. But I just knew he wasn't someone that I wanted to be part of my team. And like I said, most of my lenders are awesome. But if you run into somebody like that, or if you end up getting a lender that annoys you, or in my case, annoys my office staff, I fire them. And I know this is kind of odd on a call like this, a podcast to talk about firing lenders when we're talking about attracting and converting them. But it doesn't hurt. And it's a good thing to know. And here's how I fire somebody if somebody loans me money, and I decide I don't want to be in business with them, I just pay them back. I just bring in another lender and pay the loan off. And then I've got a new lender on that property. And then every time that lender that I don't want to do business with comes around, I'll tell him that I'm good. And I'm always good whenever he comes around that I never need money <laughs> from him or her. That is rare though. That might happen to, if you got 40 lenders, that might happen to you once every three years or something like that. So it's a rarity. And when I said I don't want them to bug me when you asked me that question, what happens is my lenders loan me money and they sit back and wait for a bigger check. And that's it. I've got a, a lady, her name's Blanche, a wonderful lady. And I met her in a, in a group meeting and she had a yellow legal tablet with a bunch of writing on it. And she asked me question after question after question after question. I thought this lady just showed up just to make my life miserable today. But I successfully answered all of her questions. And I remember her walking out the door and I thought this lady doesn't have two nickels to rub together. You know how we prejudge folks? Well, she came back and she loaned me 25000 and 35000 45000 110000 I mean, she was up, up around a quarter million dollars. And I realized in retrospect that those questions, half the questions were about being a private money lender. And the other half is about being a real estate investor. And I'll be darned if she didn't buy a rental property and it was dead flat straight across the street from one of mine, I could stand on my porch and wave a Blanche on her porch across the the street. And so she would come into the office every now and then because she'd want to get a rental application for her tenant and things like that. So we took care of her. But normally, you know, they'll loan you money. I got another lender in town that he has subways 
and he likes to get together to have coffee every now and then or tea. And so we'll get together every couple months and he's traveling the world quite a bit now. Just a wonderful person. And he got me into oil wells. You talked about what you were doing down there. So now I got 45 oil wells. So, you know, pieces of them. So you sound like a Texan. You're in Ohio though, right? <laughs> That's right. Well, he got me into the oil wells. That was my idea, but yeah, I bought a bunch. Kind of what I'm leaning to right here is when you got private lenders, you're dealing with people that got money and they can get you into some other cool things and they can hook you up with some other great people. And so, you know, it's a good place to be. That's another benefit of working with people with private money because a lot of them are, are well to do. Your network is going to affect your net worth. And that is totally, totally true. Okay, I'm going to throw you kind of a curveball, a little difficult question, or not difficult, but I mean, might need a, a bit of an explanation. But I'm curious, do you do one lender per property? Do you create securities? You know, how advanced do you get in with your private lending? I'm sorry, borrowing, your private borrowing, I should say. Yeah, you can do one lender, one property, but sometimes that lender doesn't have enough money to cover all your costs. Those four different areas I talked about earlier. You know, they don't have enough to cover rehab and all that. And so you, you bring in a second lender and you, know, you can have as many mortgages as you want on a property. Of course, if you somebody in the 73rd position, it's not going to be too tickled, but yeah. <laughs> but, Forget you heard that listeners. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. It's a joke. Yeah, no. yeah, I typically it's one-to-one, -one, but it, it can be two. I have had over the years, I had three from time to time because I needed a property to secure the loan and park the money for a while for some people. They had just had a low amount of money. So you just don't over leverage the property. Back exactly what you were talking about before when you're talking about the LTV and the 70% and all that, you know, overdo it. And I took a look at my property at one time and I was at, I averaged about 63% for my properties. So yeah, you can have more, you know, and the nice thing about the beauty of what we're teaching here is you got total control. Here's the deal. If your lender that you're looking at doesn't have the money to do that, you just go get another lender and bring them in and just have one person or you can keep that first lender and bring in a second lender and the bigger chunk of money gets the first position, second chunk of money, the lower chunk of money gets the second position. Okay. So you put them in subsequent positions based on when they come into it. Okay. And the lean position, that's what I was curious about. Yeah. I wondered, you said something about, do I create a security? Well, a mortgage is a security. However, you know, generally state laws, as long as it's my money, there's no you know, security law there. But in a sense, like, do you do syndications? We're speaking primarily on single family residences right now. I was wondering if you do any multifamily or commercial industrial to where you're maybe sponsoring a deal, but you're bringing in a lot of other people, more than just one or two investors, or do your houses get a little fancy? I assume Ohio is more expensive than Texas. So as far as the cost of living. No guarantee there, buddy. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I buy a property here, if it's got a toilet in it, that's a luxury home for me sometimes. I mean, you got low end stuff here. Let's talk a little bit about this. About 35% of my student base is commercial folks. And when you talk about a security, the promissory note is uh, creates a security. There's some big document that if you look at out there with the SEC, they'll say, here's what creates a security. What does that mean, a security? It means that the Securities and Exchange Commission have the right to set rules on stuff like that. And so they have the right to set the rules on the promissory note. And the thing of it is, so many people are concerned about that because they don't understand what the SEC is or if it's the Wild West and they don't come into play or do they come into play? Well, actually, the rules are very, very simple. The problem of it is most real estate investors don't know what the rules are. In fact, I believe it's about 90 percent of real estate investors don't know what the rules are with the SEC. Well, I hired an SEC attorney. And like you said at the outset, I'm not an attorney, but I hired an attorney to research every state in the United States and Canada. And when he got done, he called me up and he said, hey, I want to thank you. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, I'm moving into my new house and you just bought it. That's how much money I spent with the guy. But having that knowledge is tremendous. You see, it's like a sporting event. I was a high school offensive and defensive guard. And when I went out for football, the coach would teach me how to block and tackle and how to play the stance, get into the stance. What he also did was hand me a rule book. And with that rule book, it said, if you're carrying the ball and you go 10 yards, you get a first down, you're carrying the ball and you go across the goal line, you get a touchdown. What we do as real estate investors is exactly the same as a sporting event when you're dealing with private lenders. You've got to have the knowledge on the blocking and tackling, which is how to buy a right property and how to rehab the property and how to sell a property. But you also need that rule book. 
and that rule book is on the SEC. And there's seven programs underneath the umbrella of the SEC that, that we can use, and some of those are federal and some of those are state-specific. And so what has happened to me and has been a tremendous blessing is because I hired that attorney, when I speak all over the nation, is I can teach exactly what folks are allowed to do in that state. And there's five areas that are controlled in every single state. But the SEC has really boiled this down to where it's simple. Number one, you can't jump off this call and in this podcast and start advertising to get private lenders unless you've filled out some paperwork. And most of it is extremely cheap and simple to do. And uh, then you can go advertise. And you're allowed to advertise, but you have to fill out the paperwork first. And that's rules of the SEC since they control this. The other one is pooling. That means what you were talking about a little bit ago, where you put two or more lenders on a, not just where I was talking about stacking up mortgages, but you put them onto the same promissory note. Well, in that case, then that would be pooling money. And that's just like advertising. You have to fill out some paperwork before you do that. The other one is commissions. You're not allowed to pay commissions. And the reason for that was there was this dude called Charles Ponzi. Maybe you heard of Charles. Back in the 1920s, he came over from Italy. And he realized that stamps over there were low. They called them coupons, were cheap. And over here, they went for a higher price. And he wanted to set up this investment thing where he would buy the stamps in Italy and sell them over here. And so he started to find private lenders to do that. And then in February of 1920, he had like $56,000 in today's money. And by the time he got to July, he had millions. And the only problem with it is he forgot to buy the stamps. What he did, though, was he anybody that loaned him money, he told them if they, they would find another lender, he would give them a commission. Well, that was back in the 20s, and then the SEC was created in 1933, and they looked back on what Charles did and said, no, nah, you can't do this. We don't allow commissions. There's only three states out there that allows finders, what's called finders, and your state's one of them. And so they allow finders. So you can't pay the people commission. You can pay them a flat fee, but you can hire people to find private lenders for you. So the other two items of these five that I'm giving you, which is allowed in every single state, is thresholds. One is the number of lenders that you can have in a year. And in my state, it's 10. And actually, it's 16 months here. We're the only one that goes out that far. In your state, uh, I believe you said 35. Basically, private lending under 35 were safe in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that is the number of lenders that they allow you to have within a year. And uh, now you can go unlimited, but you have to fill out a piece of paper to go unlimited. And then the last one would be the dollar amount, how much you can raise a year. And then typically it's a million, but you can go unlimited too. And you just need to know how to do that. And you fill out some paperwork and you can do that. In fact, I teach people how to raise $5 million and only have to pay 700 bucks and fill out a two-page form, which is something my attorney uncovered, which is powerful. So the point is on this SEC piece is people should not shy away from that at all. The thing of it is, you just need to learn about it. And just like anything else, you know, get into the real estate business, you learn about how to rehab, you learn about the, the rules and you just follow the rules. And it's so important to be safe. Absolutely. You know, even though private lenders aren't necessarily regulated or governed, the people who are borrowing the money, they, they need to know what they're bound to. And really at the end of the day, I kind of laughed when you said, you know, the SEC has made it easy because they're a government entity, but they have. And it's really, it's just, it's paperwork and to stay compliant, letting them know you know, here's my situation. This is what I'm going to do. Here's my fee. Here's my paperwork. They look at it. They bless it. You're fine. Great. Now you can go raise money. And, you know, I'm not going to get into the whole accredited, non-accredited and sophisticated investor. You know, just let them know what you're doing. Keep everything above board. To me, it's akin to you not taking a direct check from a lender, but let's put this in escrow at the title company. And let's do everything above board. It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. So, Okay. So you not only invest, but you teach the single family how to get private lenders, multifamily. I'm wondering, with all the success you've had and looking back on your career, is there anything you would have done different or is there something that you saw coming but didn't jump on or you know, any regrets? Well, what I'd done quicker is I would have learned the SEC stuff quicker because I was out buying property and borrowing money from banks and savings loans and stuff like that. And then along the way, I found out about private lenders, but I didn't know the rules. In fact, I was down in Florida at someone's boot camp. There was a guy there that had private lenders, and we were talking out in the hallway. And I said, what are the rules? And he says, there isn't any. Go do whatever you want. 
what he was told totally wrong. There is some rules. And so I hired an SEC attorney to make sure that I knew the rules for myself and then also for training. I wanted to make sure that I knew because and when I first hired that attorney, I thought the guy in, down in Florida was right, that there wasn't any rules, but I just wanted to be sure. And he was dead wrong. And there is some rules, but the rules are easy to follow. You just need to know what they are. And so that is probably the thing I would have done. I would have just sped that up and done it quicker in my career. That's a great point. Before we sign off, I want to give you an opportunity to give us some links, give us some contact information. How can people learn more about you, about your programs, your education? And I really want to highly recommend listeners go check out Alan's offerings because they are thorough, to say the least. If you, if you look at his website, you'll see very quickly that you've done the due diligence and the groundwork. So how can we get in touch with you? I got some free stuff here. How about if we give some information on that? I just used my name, Alan Cowgill. It's A-L-A-N Cowgill, C-O-W-G-I-L-L.com. So www.alancowgill.com and then a forward slash. And if you put the word after the forward slash, you put the word answers, A-N-S-W-E-R-S. You get a free uh, ebook on private money, 21 things about private money. And then what I need to tell you is once you get your free ebook, I've got a hugely discounted offer behind that. Once you get your free ebook, then you'll get another page. And if you want to take a advantage of it, but I've got a private lending home study system that's $697 on my website as a hard copy, but I put it on this page as a digital for 197 bucks and you get it instantly. And so anybody listening right now, you know, you want to get started on the easiest way to get private money. To give you a little background on this system, this is how I got started with the techniques that are in this system. And at my live event, I teach these techniques the first day and we raise multi-millions of dollars within 24 hours of my live event. There's no place else on planet Earth that happens. And we've raised over a half a billion dollars of private money in the first 24 hours using the techniques that you'll find in that home study system. I've got a couple other free eBooks for you. Same main, www.alancowell.com. But on this next one, you do a forward slash and then put the words in one word all private lending. Make one word private lending. And you get six reasons why you need private lenders. Great little ebook that I created. The third item, we talked a little bit about the SEC. So how about if I give you something on the SEC? So here again, go to alancowell.com forward slash SEC. And it's how to, what they do and how to stay off the radar with the SEC. So three great ebooks. So you'll love them. Thank you for providing those. And the synergy here is amazing. Like I said, I don't hate Wall Street, but I love not needing them for investments. I like not needing banks. And one day I'm going to do a whole episode of solo cast on the evils of the Federal Reserve, but not yet. I'll reserve that to some other day, but just stay compliant. It's very libertarian and individualistic, I guess, but it's, you know, just stay compliant, play by the rules. And there's no reason you can't build wealth the old way that we've been doing it for thousands of years with handshakes. So Alan, thank you so much for coming on, and I will definitely reach back out to you. I'd like to have you on again before the year's out. I'd normally try to space about a year, but I think we're in the same boat, just on opposite ends. So I definitely want to stay in touch with you and bring you back and see how things are going in, in the future. I'd love that. You know, this has been a real pleasure, and I want to thank you very, very much to, for asking me, and I really enjoy this, and I hope it's good for your folks. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And there it is. I'd like to give a big thank you to Alan Calgill for sharing his time and his thoughts with us today. And please make sure you go over to the show notes page to connect with Alan and learn more about his investing strategies and programs and how to connect with him. And I'd like to also thank Alan for unknowingly setting me on the path in life and investing that has ultimately led me to his interview on my podcast. And I'm going to ask you that you please, please be patient with me in, when I, in regards to getting the Private Lender Academy off the ground. Let's just put it on the shelf until sometime later in the year when I'll have some more things figured out and hopefully some more time on my hands. So let's revisit that in about six months. So maybe maybe September, October of 2019. But in the meantime, I will do the one-on-one -on -one coaching on the web here and there. Little here, little there, but I'm still trying to put it all together. But anyway, give me some time. That's the bottom line. I need some more time. And this podcast is completely free of charge to listen to every week. And all I ask in return is that you please spread the word and help others find the show so they can listen and learn as well. And you can do this by leaving a rating and review 
primarily at iTunes or Google, wherever you listen. But if you could go into iTunes, leave a review, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it, and it'll make my day. And to make it easy, you can go to the show notes, and there'll be a link that will take you over to iTunes and let you leave a rating and review. And all I ask is for an honest review. Would love five stars, but please give me an honest review. You can also connect with me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Bigger Pockets. The links to all those channels can be found at privatelenderpodcast.com. I appreciate you guys listening today, and I want to thank you for your time and consideration. And please keep reaching out to me. I really appreciate all the feedback that I receive. So besides health and happiness, I wish you all safe and prosperous private lending. I'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Private Lender Podcast with your host, Keith Baker. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit privatelenderpodcast.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review, and we'll catch you next time.